Thank you, everybody, for coming. I am Janice Min. I am the uh, president of The Hollywood Reporter and Billboard. Um, I would like to welcome our panelists today. Uh, to my far left here is Jeff Schell, chairman of Universal Film Entertainment Group, Universal Studios, uh, Leslie Moonves, president and CEO of CBS Corporation, Nancy Dubuque, CEO of A&E Networks, and over here, Bobby Kotick, president and CEO of Activision Blizzard. So I wanted to start with Jeff. Um, just two days ago, Jeffrey Katzenberg said here at this very conference, movies are not a growth business. You just took over the film studio a little more than half a year ago. What is your response? So I'd just like to say for the record that Bobby emailed me last night and told me he wasn't wearing a tie. So it's all his fault. <laughs> um, thanks, Bobby. Uh, so I... <laughs> I actually started to ruin I also that. told you I was playing in the Lakers <laughs> next year, and you didn't believe that. <laughs> so uh, I, I actually read about, read about that. I, 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 think that I actually disagree. I think the, the film business is going to be a tremendous growth, vision, uh, growth business for two, two reasons. First, I came to this job from international. That's where I st you know, started at NBC Universal. And if you look at the business internationally, 70% of our revenue now comes from international. So if you, if, if you look at the statistics domestically, sure, ticket sales are flat and the, the market's matured. But if you look at international, most of the markets international that are growing like crazy from a theatrical perspective. You just have to look at China or Latin America. So given that 70% of our revenue comes from international and given that the international markets are just starting to take off, um, I actually think filmed entertainment's a great business. And just as an aside, as I went around the world the last three years, and you walk into a platform like Sky or Canal Plus, they want to talk about big, big, you know, movies, big, big shows. That's what they want from from Hollywood. And I think from that perspective, film business can be great. Second thing that affects all of us is digital, where you know, digital obviously comes with lots of challenges. But from a film perspective, the the ability to watch all of our products on lots of devices and lots of places is just going to be great for the film business, whereas before you had to go to the movie theater and then you had to you know, catch a, a movie on the channel you wanted to watch. Now with digital, you can watch on Netflix, you can watch on iTunes, you can watch all these places. So I think the combination of digital and international actually make the movie business a phenomenal business, and I think it's going to be a growth business, and I wouldn't have taken the job, frankly, if, it hadn't, if I hadn't believed that. Let me follow up with Les, who, you have CBS Films, you are the king of television, but you mm -hmm. also have CBS Films. What, what was your opinion of, of No, that? see, see what, what Jeffrey said, well, Jeff Bucus on their earnings call this morning said, he sort of took a shot at Katzenberg, he said, maybe for your films, <laughs> uh, there's no growth. So, uh, you know, that Good was Bucus' uh, <laughs> quote, but uh, not mine. Look, our film company is, we do two to three movies a year, it's a tiny little company, it's it doesn't even move the needle. You know, we, we like the film business, we like the content business. As Jeff said, which I totally agree, anybody who's producing content today, and that's all four of us on this panel, the future is extraordinarily bright. As, as the world evolves, there are more and more places to get the content, and the, the digital world, you know, the, the future is very bright for content. Everybody, anybody who says, I'm producing content and it's not a growth area, I think is sorely mistaken because we're seeing growth all over the place. Okay, so Nancy, this is a good segue into a question for you. Um, the New York Times' David Carr recently quoted uh, FX's John Landgraf in a highly critical piece about uh, Marissa Mayer wanting to buy TV shows at Yahoo. And in the story, Landgraf said, it is the pure arrogance of the newly rich and newly powerful to think content is easy. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I agree with John that content is not easy, but I don't begrudge or criticize anybody who wants to get in the game. I think it's an incredibly uh, healthy business, as I echo what Les said. You know, storytelling is uh, not dead and is not going to be for a long, t long time. As a culture, we have thrived on it, you know, even before television was invented. Um, and we're just getting better and better at um, being able to tell stories through technology, through, uh, through platforms, through distribution, what have you. So, you know, I look at it as, um, while it makes the business more competitive and it makes our day-to-day -day operation more challenging, um, it also makes us better. And you have to look at it that way. You know, we're, we're a very, very competitive industry. Um, by nature, we're a competitive group of people. We probably wouldn't be in this industry if we weren't. Um, and so, you know, may the best man win. Um, you gave an interesting comment yesterday at the cable show where you said, we are living in a content bubble. <laughs> I didn't know what to say up there with a bunch of technology people. I was like, why am I up here on this panel today? 
Um, but what does that mean? What you know, I think. Um, I think there's a. I, I meant it more from the from the standpoint of what we're seeing go on in in my world. You know, we're very dependent on a, a lot of small independent production companies, and we're seeing um, really exuberant transactions take place for companies that don't own their IP, and um, and and that concerns me really from a creative standpoint. Not because everyone doesn't deserve their payday, but because in our business, we're spending a lot more time talking about the deal and talking about the transaction and not enough time talking about the creative. And I think that's why you see sort of a, a, a lack of um, you know, innovation in terms of storytelling, in terms of show ideas. There shouldn't be 17 versions of Pawn Stars on television. There's just, it's, I, that makes my heart sink. When, you know, I turn on the TV as a consumer and I can't find anything to watch. Shame right. on us. Right. Okay. Um, Bobby, uh, Activision has set the bar high with console, with Call of Duty for consoles, War of Warcraft. Um, Skylanders was a big bet, also huge. Uh, technology is changing the world of gaming as it is for Hollywood very quickly. Uh, can you explain, talk, address the issue of what Activision is doing to compete in the world of free to play? I can, but I have to say first, sitting here and knowing the people who are my other panelists and knowing how sophisticated and capable they are, the idea that these people will be spending their time in something that wasn't a growth business with enormous opportunity is incomprehensible to me. But in fact, listening to them, I get excited about the prospects that we could have with our intellectual property in film and television. And I think if you think about the developing economies of the world, and you look at the rapid uh, adoption of the mobile internet, the content that they create is going to have more opportunity for monetization and distribution than ever in any time in history. Um, and, and likewise with us, and I think, so then uh, to your question about free-to-play, I think one of the things that you've seen is that the way that people access content, regardless of whether it's interactive or narrative content, there are a whole host of business models, all of which have a lot of promise and potential. And they call it free-to-play, but in, in many ways it's really free-to-start. And so you get access to the content in a way that's comfortable for you, from a payment perspective, and then you have the opportunity to participate and play. Lots of geographies in the world, you could take a country like China, for example, the cost of entry needs to be free in order to encourage involvement and participation. And so I think that's just another one of the very attractive business models that's available to content providers. And are you <coughs> looking to build out in that space through your own development or through acquisitions? We're doing it ourselves, and we have, you know, one of the top free-to-play games right now is a new game that Blizzard released called Hearthstone. I think it's the number one downloaded app in the App Store right now on iTunes, and it's enormously popular. I don't think we've announced the numbers. We have our conference call next week, but, um, you know, this is a great category of growth for us and something that we've been investing in for a number of years, and we expect, like all the other categories of interactive entertainment, we will lead in. Mm -hmm. um, and currently you are, you have, World of Warcraft being developed into a movie. Um, how, has your, how have your interactions with Hollywood been? Personally or professionally? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which one's more interesting? <laughs> the, the personal ones are probably more interesting, but professionally I would say, uh, you know... Yeah, Bobby dates a lot of actors. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that, you know? But, uh, I, I would say, uh, you know, World of Warcraft, is the fr it was a project that was in uh, development before we were partners with Blizzard. Mm -hmm. And we're very reticent to allow our intellectual property to be used for anything other than game making because they're very different media. And you know, be it, this is an interesting experiment. It's a, a, a great producer and a great director, and it seems like they're off to a very good start. But you know, it's not a business that we know a lot about, and so I think there's a lot of risk for us in allowing our intellectual property to be developed in a, in a medium that isn't something we really understand. Okay. Um, Les, uh, you have been in the headlines a lot. You're always in the headlines a lot, but recently for Late Night. Um, yep. So uh, you made the change recently from David Letterman to Stephen Colbert. Um, just two days ago, Craig Ferguson announced he's stepping down in eight months. Um, and so both of these shows, both of these hours, you'll now likely own. Mm -hmm. um, Correct. Can you talk about the economics of Late Night and why they matter still? 
Well, late night is not what it used to be. During the days of Johnny Carson, even the early days of David Letterman, it was much more of a profit center for all of us. Um, the last few years, it's been more about bragging rights, and clearly we're at a point where there's a real generational change. You know, when you make a decision, like NBC did with Jimmy Fallon, ABC did with Jimmy Kimmel, and now us with Stephen Colbert, these are decisions that are going to last, hopefully, right. for 20 years. Right. You know, these are generational issues. It's not like a pilot that comes and goes, and you say, okay, I missed on that one. These are big, big decisions. Um, late night is a very important part of our culture. It is not as economically profitable as it used to be. Um, so they make a lot about the ratings, you know, and that really doesn't affect the bottom line. So I'd rather have the best guy maybe that doesn't quite have the ratings of the other guy. And uh, I think we do now, we do in Letterman, and I think we're going to with Colbert. By the way, this was with great regard for Fallon and Kimmel. I think, I think the late night wars, quote unquote, you're going to have three tremendous guys at the network who are all extremely talented, and it's going to be a, a very good time for late night television. So uh, and we have an interview that we um, posted to at the Hollywood Reporter from Nina Tassler with Nina Tassler saying right. that you won't have anyone in place before the upfronts for the 1235 slot. But what are you creatively thinking for that spot? You know what? This is really a wide open territory. We're looking at a lot of different people, a lot of different ideas, and it's sort of great to say, all right, between now and January 1st, we got to figure out some other way to do it. Uh, having Colbert in place is great. I think it'll attract a lot of great talent for the 1230 slot, but we don't know what we're going to do. Uh, you know, it really is, we, we really are figuring out. You know, with, when Letterman announced that he was going to be gone, it was really important for us to fill that void and fill it quickly. We didn't like the rumors that were out there, especially some of the names that were throwing their names out there, uh, are people that might not have been at the top of our hit parade, uh -huh. shall we say. Um, so we needed to get it done quickly, and we did, and we were very pleased that you know, we were able to make a deal as quick, and Stephen Colbert is phenomenal. So uh, knowing that he's gonna be there for the next 20 years makes me feel better. Uh -huh. Um, and are you concerned there's just been the slightest hint of uh, people expressing concern about his politi the political views he has expressed on Comedy Central? Do you, and CBS is a big, broad broadcast network. You know what? Uh, you know, ironically, you know, you know, Stephen Colbert is much more moderate than people think he is. He's a great social commentator, and that's sort of what we want. That's sort of what David Letterman has been. Um, if you're referring to remarks from Rush Limbaugh that yes. we have attacked the heartland of America. I would uh, <clears throat> respectfully disagree with that assessment of who Stephen Colbert is. And as one reporter said, so suddenly Rush is going soft on Letterman. Right. You know, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to the interest that Stephen's going to bring. He's very smart. He's very funny. And it's going to be exciting. Okay. Um, Nancy, cable TV hasn't entered late night the late night game in any meaningful way outside of Comedy Central and a few other attempts. Why is that? Um, you know, I think when you look at broadcast versus cable, which, you know, I'm not one to like to endorse that thinking, <laughs> um, but if you do look at it, we're, you know, we still are a relatively young business. Um, the, the portfolio that I run is um, just over 25 years old. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is, his, history is only about 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So when you think about you know, that maturation of our business and where we're going in programming, um, we've largely been built on a model where we can repeat our shows and we can monetize them across our entire schedule. And if you, you know, Bonnie Hammer will have you, you know, she thinks that we created binge viewing mm -hmm. <laughs> in the cable model and the way that we've run our shows. And so, you know, Programs that are sort of a one and done model haven't traditionally worked for us, but I do think that um, the repeat model in cable is under stress. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is because of the DVR and because of Netflix and Amazon and all of the places that you can get content. Mm -hmm. You know, the viewer no longer has to be satisfied with whatever we're feeding them versus a traditional schedule. So um, it's not to say that we haven't looked at it. Um, 
but you know most of our revenue and most of our focus is still the traditional primetime viewer. Mm -hmm. um, and we analyze everything of where can we be distinct and where can we be competitive. Mm -hmm. There are three really great shows out there in television at 11.30, or, right. and, and how can I play in a way that's gonna be better than that? Right. Um, and sometimes the analysis is, we'll go do something really different. Right. Don't go and do what everybody else is doing. And that's how we, we look at it creatively. Um, you did something amazing in 2007 when you put this show, Ice Road Truckers, on history, which t on paper sounds like not a great idea. Um, and then you put Pawn Stars on and you turned history into the second most watched cable channel for men after ESPN. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you look at the... My grandfather's here, still mad at me, by the way, but... <laughs> <laughs> Not enough World War II documentaries. Um, and, uh, but now, now you, you are CEO of a huge cable empire that has $3.5 billion in revenue. Where do you see the white space now? Um, you know, I still think that there's growth in our brands. Um, you know, Lifetime is beginning its turnaround story, and that's an incredibly um, lucrative and exciting brand for women. You know, I, I remember not too long ago when Lifetime was the number one network in cable, um, and, and we're not in this business to be satisfied with it being the number 10 network. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, history, I think, is doing some incredible work with the Vikings, you know, is um, come back very strong in season two. It's the subject of a Jay-Z song, I was told last night, wow. which I didn't realize. <laughs> um, very exciting. Um, you know, we have roots going into pre-production. We've been uh, uh, very strong in the event space. And I think that, you know, in order to be strong in the event space, you have to be measured. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, you can't do them too often. And you have to make sure that what you're selecting and what you're getting behind truly is an event mm -hmm. for American. Um, we're expanding our, our smaller tier networks, which, you know, when you take a closer look, aren't that small. Um, you know, we, uh, LMN and soon to be uh, FYI and H2 are all in 70 million plus homes. LMN is in 85 million and we're starting to really pivot and spend uh, resources and attention to original programming in those brands. Mm -hmm. um, H2 is, you know, a really incredible complement to history. So it allows us to own the spectrum in a wider swath, not just the, you know, just the History Channel audience, but we can go more upscale, we can go slightly older, we can go slightly younger, and just you know, really diversify our portfolio of channels the way we would diversify shows on a primetime lineup. Mm -hmm. Um, so on the subject of cable still, uh, Jeff, everyone on this panel is impacted by distribution. Within your NBC Universal family, you have Comcast and Time Warner possibly coming together, um, where and the traditional belief is that content is treated like a commodity by the cable companies. On the other hand, you now oversee a film studio where filmmakers in Hollywood will fight to the death against day and date releases and windows, and shorter windows. So how are you navigating your company's, what, what some people believe to be your company's competing interests? Well, so I, first of all, I take issue with the fact that, that distributors think content is commodity. I mean, I think content is what built, you know, the pipes mean nothing if it's not for the content going through the pipes. and. I think one of the things that's been great about Comcast is they've actually invested to change the pipes so that people can watch content in lots of different ways. You know, I live in Los Angeles now, but I lived in Philadelphia and I lived in London, and the platforms you get in different cities are dramatically different. And for people here in Los Angeles who haven't seen the new X1 platform or X2 platform, the ability to see the content produced up here on the stage in a different way is tremendous because you need to have that to, to enjoy the, the, the content in the way that you want to watch it. So I actually don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think they're, they're the, um, the world of expanding and, and, and differentiated platforms is going to be great for all content producers. And I think in the movie business, where our business is at the far extreme of that, where we're launching a new thing every week or every two weeks and have to find a way to get people to come watch it or come see it, um, I think these kind of platforms are going to be great for our product. I love Vikings, by the way, too. Thank you. <laughs> you sing about it occasionally. <laughs> um, um, well, let me ask you a question. So, would you, are you, there was an incident with Tower Heist, where you were not at the studio at the time, where exhibitors threatened to pull the movie with the, because of a shortened window. So, you have Fifty Shades of Grey coming out that maybe some people have heard of in 2015, and that seems like a Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, yes. <laughs> so that seems like a. a, a Is it really on How Valentine's romantic. Day? <laughs> <laughs> but that will be there. <laughs> yeah. But that potentially, I know there was some speculation, which I know Donna Langley did not 
you know, she put to rest a bit, but would you ever consider an experiment on a hot movie like that, making that day and date release? No. I mean, I think, I, I actually think the night, you know, we all, we're all going to benefit for, from our content being on lots of different platforms at lots of different times. And I, I, I agree with what Les said before, that this is the kind of the golden age for content that, you know, in these world of different platforms. But we all kind of have a starting platform. Mm -hmm. And for the movie business, the theatrical um, platform is kind of the, you know, that's been the historical platform. And in fact, most filmmakers make their movies to be seen in a movie theater with other people, with a great sound and great picture. And I don't, Fifty Shades of Grey is a, is a, um, is going to be an intimate movie, you know, um, but it's going to be a movie best watched the way the filmmaker wanted you to watch it, which is in a, a, a theater. Now, vast, a lot of people are going to end up watching that movie on, you know, their TV, their, their iPad. Um, probably by the time it gets to those windows, their, their phone or other devices and mobile internet, I agree with Bobby, is going to change the way people watch things all over the world. But I think for, for us, the theatrical window is extremely important, and we're not going to go day and date with Fifty Shades of Grey. It, it'll start in the theaters, and it'll be its, its, its primary starting point. Okay. I think a lot of people are going to want to watch that at home with their spouse. <laughs> yeah. that or would, alone. That would be my guess. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you know. <laughs> um, so, Les, on the topic of Comcast Time Warner. So, last yes. year, mm -hmm. CBS gave Time Warner a pretty thorough beatdown. Um, pulling its signal off the air until it got a big rate bump. And Time Warner Cable lost 300,000 subscribers before caving. Mm -hmm. um, would the fight have ended differently if a larger Comcast Time Warner Cable combination had been the opponent? Um, I think it would have, but not because of the size of it. I think it would have because of a rationality that goes on. Our, our conflict with Time Warner was not about pricing. Mm -hmm. The pricing was resolved fairly quickly. It was about digital rights, and Time Warner Cable basically stated to us, now let's keep the digital rights situation where it was five years ago, mm -hmm. before there were iPads, before there was Netflix, before our content w was online. Comcast, you know, has been one of the most advanced thinking of companies in that way. It's not to say we don't have our disputes with Comcast and that we won't have in the future, but these issues that came up with Time Warner wouldn't come up with the Comcast people. It would be resolved. It would be figured out. So it, it was, you know, the Time Warner had a very antiquated way of looking at the world mm -hmm. um, and basically said, oh, broadcast is old school. We used to get it for free. Therefore, we should have all these rights. And that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. um, Nancy, how does that possibly impact your future, Comcast, Time Warner Cable? Um, you know, look, it, it's going to be a big company. <laughs> we all know that. And, um, and, and what it can control, uh, you know, will be meaningful in terms of um, our business. Um, you know, I do take some um, comfort in that Comcast appreciates content. Mm -hmm. They have a vested interest in, in the content business. And... Um, and if one of the cable operators out there were to get this big, I'd like, you know, it, it makes more sense for it to be Comcast. Mm -hmm. I do find them to be um, very reasonable, very progressive. Their interface is, um, you know, helps make the experience of what we produce better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we're talking about that internally. I mean, their, their ad sales footprint is going to be meaningful. Um, what will that mean to us in terms of a very big part of our revenue? Um, the local advertising market will be different, um, I think, under their umbrella. We don't know yet what they're going to do. We don't know yet the kind of impact they're going to have. So it would be, um, you know, it's a little presumptuous to comment on what hasn't happened yet. But the, the areas that we're looking at are, you know, uh, obviously uh, ad sales, obviously the control of the broadband and, and all the things that we're all. Yeah, as, as all of us have to deal with as we look towards Comcast, Time Warner, Future, we can't forget, and I don't think we ever do, they have a very good network that's competing with me. Yeah. They have very good cable networks <laughs> right. that are competing with Nancy. Right. So, you know, and, and there are going to be concessions made and guarantees that we are treated fairly, and it's something that has to be dealt with, you know, because mm -hmm. they're smart and they're strong. Mm -hmm. And they won't be the last merger. Right, right. Correct. And you'd think it wouldn't have had any effect on me there, Time Warner, negotiation, but I was away on vacation with him that Labor Day weekend. He was very cranky and it ruined my weekend. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he absolutely That was loved. unrelated. He was absolutely <laughs> loved, you know. Uh. 
Uh, <laughs> so, uh, speaking of things that could potentially make you cranky, um, Aereo. Oh, what's yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so, it's cur- the case is before the Supreme Court right now. Yes, it is. Um, how do you feel it's going? I think our case is very strong. I think the law clearly is in our favor. I think our guys presented a terrific case. Um, I think the, the, the interesting thing is Aereo's trying to forgive the pun, cloud the issue Mm -hmm. here about what we do with our content. So what Aereo is basically saying, because the law is not on their side, is if you stop Aereo, you're going to be stopping technology moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what they've put out there. That's what the press has written about. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our content is all over the place online. We have deals with Netflix, we have deals with Amazon, we have deals with Hulu Plus, we have deals with YouTube. The idea that Aereo would, you know, the stopping of Aereo would stop our, our participation in what is a technological revolution is clearly silly. What is different about Aereo is unlike these other places, the Netflix, the Amazons, the Hulu Pluses, who pay us for the content, Aereo takes our content, sells it to the consumer, it doesn't pay us for it. Mm-hmm. So we sort of feel like that's theft. And I think the creative community should feel exactly that way. Um, I feel good about our chances in the Supreme Court. You obviously never know right. what those nine justices will stay, say. But as I said, Aereo is trying to confuse the issue. And do you stand by your earlier statements you once made that you would pull CBS off the air? I'll stand by my statement that we have other alternatives if perchance we should lose. There are a lot of other things that we we could do. There would be no financial consequence to CBS. There are other things we could do to offset it, including OTT, including becoming a cable network, all sorts of propositions, obviously. But we don't think it's going to come to that. We think the Supreme Court's going to do the right thing and honor the law and honor copyright. Have you try to sit down and speak mogul to mogul with Barry Diller about this? Barry Diller actually is a very good friend of mine. I have great respect and affection for Barry. Um, the truth is, early on, we had one conversation. We decided that probably wasn't a good idea for the friendship, and we have never spoken <laughs> about it again. It's, it's absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. <laughs> um, in, in, your, in your NBC Universal world, Jeff, this will have some impact, too. What, what, what's going on internally uh, in the thought process? At, at your company? Well, I mean, it's not my, part of my business, but I think we stand completely aligned with where Les and CBS is. It's just, it's not a legal issue, it's just frankly stealing the content. So it's, uh, it's the laws on our side, as Les said, and we're hopeful, I think the case was well presented and, and, and we're hopeful that the Supreme Court will, will find on the right side for it. Okay. Um, I wanted to move on to the costs of producing entertainment. So uh, Jeff at Universal and at all the studios, there's been, We've written about it, the the death of the $200 million movie, um, that the gamble is too big, or unless you're sharing costs with a partner. Um, What do you have to say about that? I think think the interesting thing, I mean, I've been at this movie thing for seven months now, so it's been (laughs) very short, so still definitely on the early parts of the learning curve here. But I think that the interesting thing about the movie business is you see movies thriving at kind of all edges of of the cost curve. You see... You know, we have we have movies that we spend five million dollars on that are tremendous hits, and then you have movies that you spend a hundred plus on that that don't do what you hope they would do. And the reality is, the nice thing about the movie business is there's lots of different products for lots of different people, and I think you have to be diverse in your offering as a big studio, and you have to have a portfolio, and you have to be in every every game. So I think the key is you have to make you know smart, thoughtful decisions. You have to work with the best people, and you have to have the best monetization engine you can to to try to make money from them. Um, Fast and Furious is an enormously successful franchise for Universal, and people within Hollywood believe the studio has done an amazing job managing the situation after one of the stars, Paul Walker, died. Um, Now the movie's being released next summer, but can you talk about how, in your new role, do you make that franchise bigger than just going from movie to movie every two summers? Well, so it's interesting. A couple comments on that. First of all, I, I had a benefit of joining a great team at Universal. Um, Donna, you know, w- when, when the tragedy happened with Paul Walker, we were able to kind of put the business aside for a couple months and just say, let's, let's treat this as human beings. This is a group of people who had been making movies together for, you know, almost a decade. And this was a tremendous loss of a family member. 
And I think one of the things that we did well in retrospect was under Donna's leadership and Ron's leadership, we really kind of acted as human beings first mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and took care of the family and all the things we had to do, both our family and his family. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is Fast and Furious for me, as I've looked at the movie business, represents a lot of things that are happening both in the TV business and the movie business. People want to see characters year after year that evolve and change. Um, it's, it's what's behind binge viewing, it's what's, what's behind some of the great series on CBS. And I think Fast and Furious, which started as a car culture movie, has really evolved into a, um, a, uh, a you know, kind of a, a series. You know, like anything else, it's not, not altogether different than a TV yeah. series where you tune in every year or two to see what's happening to your favorite characters. It's got a tremendous Latino following. It's become one of the highest index Latino franchises. Um, we think that, you know, it's the female component who's watching the movie has gone up every, every time we've released one. And so I'm hopeful that this, this group of characters can kind of live and evolve and, 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 uh, and live for a long time going forward. Mm -hmm. So um, w we think the movie next year is gonna be spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously got a lot of, uh, a lot of aspects to it that have been very complicated, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but we think we, we came together, and really thanks to Paul Walker's family who has been helpful to us and, and supportive of us and, as we've done this. So we're excited about that film, we're excited about the future of the franchise. Great. Um, Bobby, in video games, uh, licensing versus original titles. Um, you, uh, uh, how do you see the ratio of original titles, as in owned and created intellectual property, and licensed content shifting over time? So we, we don't make very many licensed titles, and the, the, the challenge with licensed titles when you don't own the underlying intellectual property, the owner of the intellectual property has a vision and a view for how to manage the development of those properties that can be inconsistent with ours. And we, having a history that goes back to 1980 with thousands of our own titles in our library, we're much better off staying focused on the intellectual property that we own and control. Having said that, um, and I, I was thinking about this in relation to your last question, the stakes for us keep getting greater. And so I wish we could make a $200 million bet. Our newest intellectual property, Destiny, which will launch in September, is a $500 million investment. It's one of the great benefits of our business is that with low-cost capital, one of the big barriers to entry is the fact that we can successfully develop franchises with two, three, five hundred million dollar investments. I think one of the things you realize is if you're making a two to five hundred million dollar investment, you can't be beholden to somebody else for that intellectual property rights. And we've been reticent to take these intellectual properties in any direction other than interactivity E even though there is a World of Warcraft movie, largely because we're in a 35% operating margin business, the return on invested capital is far greater, the access to distribution that we have is far broader than you might think in a film or television business. And um, so for us, continuing to stay focused on what we do well, but investing in original intellectual property is the core of our business. So why is there not a Call of Duty movie? Well, there may be. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> how, much, how much do you have on you? <laughs> so, you know, I think we, the one thing that I would say, we're in a very different business. These people all spend their life thinking about how to suspend disbelief. We do the opposite, which is to unleash your inner rock star, unleash your inner soldier, get you as the protagonist to believe that the experience you're having on a screen is incredibly realistic. That's very different than an emotional connection an audience has with something on the screen. And there isn't a lot in the games that would allow you to develop that emotional connection. The other thing is when we deliver dialogue in a game, it's like bad 1950s Japanese dubbed movie. <laughs> so until you can get to the point where we can real time render facial animation and eye movement and mouth movement that is realistic, that's not gonna be a component of success for us. So is there a world where Activision has a studio component one day, its own? Sure, I think that's possible. And we have great IP. The, and the, the principal reason why I think that would be something to consider is I could never go to Jeff and say, spend $150 million on producing the Call of Duty movie, and by the way, if we don't like it, you can't release it. You know, I'm not gonna get less to commit $50 million to a television series and say it's not 
you know, adequate enough for us, you can't get your $50 million back. So we could never put the burden or the risk on somebody else. We would have to do it ourselves. And like we do with video games, be willing to say, if the content isn't going to enhance our franchise, we won't release it. No, no third party is going to do that. Not even Nancy. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Nancy, we've, we've touched briefly when we were talking about um, Late Night on the ownership of programming and content, and you recently launched A&E Studios yep. uh, to produce and own content that can live on your channels. Can you talk about the significance of what that means for your business? Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that we're not talking about a lot as an industry is, is, is how critical ownership is going to become as technology evolves. So ownership is not, you know an opportunity, it's a, it's a necessity for us. Um, we won't be able to participate in streaming um, our networks. We won't be able to participate in over the top the way that we want to. We won't be able to participate in all of these platforms that we're really excited about if we don't own our content. Um, and so that has to be a mandate for us in some way. And, and ownership doesn't mean that we don't want to be good partners and that we don't want our, our creative partners to share in the upside. It doesn't mean that you know, we want all the spoils and go, go away. It means that the deal making has to evolve to keep pace with um, what's happening from a technology standpoint. So we're still in an old Hollywood <coughs> deal making mentality with Silicon Valley opportunities. <laughs> and so that sort of has to, has to shift. So the studio is one way for us to express that. We have long owned all of our nonfiction programming. I would say at least 95% of it is, is, um, is, is owned. I think we don't own Top Gear. I think that's the one show. Um, and, and that's been incredibly lucrative and, and successful business for us. It also gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility going into this next chapter of distribution because we can offer the product. You know, we can stream our networks because of our ownership. Um, scripted has to do the same. You know, we're we're taking a <coughs> 40 to 50 million dollar bet on a movie that starts shooting next week, which is the follow-up to Hatfields, and we own it. And um, you know, that'll hurt if it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> but you, we have to do these things, and and I think the revenue streams that will be opportunities for us with all of these new platforms. You know, hopefully will we'll make sense and the business will evolve. But, um, you know, I think as it comes to binge viewing and it comes to windowing and it comes to distribution, um, th whether it's streaming video, whether it be over the top, whether it be our international channels, we're in 160 countries, we have to be in control of our destiny. And we have to have a very large, loud voice at the table in shaping what these programs should be as it relates to our brands. We have very strong brands, um, and, and that's an important component to it as well. Dennis, if you, if you want to point out one thing that's changed drastically, is exactly what Nancy was pointing out over the last five years, then the back end is becoming more important than the front end because of what's happening with technology. Because of the Netflix and the Amazons of the world and also the explosion of the international business both over the air as well as SVOD, the way we think about any piece of programming, very different than it was just a few years ago. It enabled us to do summer programming, which we never did before. We had Under the Dome. The reason Under the Dome worked is because we made an amazing deal with Amazon mm -hmm. and an amazing international sale mm -hmm. on that show. So going in, if it did a point one on the network, we were okay. Mm -hmm. We were okay, so it enabled us to do that in the summer. It obviously did more than a point one, was wildly successful, financially as mm -hmm. well as creatively, and we're doing it now with Under the Dome Part 2 and Extant. Yes. So, but but to, to Nancy's point, that whole world, the ability to sell the shows, you have to own more because that's where the money is and that's where the growth is. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some interesting partnerships happen, you know, cross networks, cross platforms. I mean, it, you know, the cost of programming is getting really expensive. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we did it inside our company and it, it sort of happened by happenstance, but we aired Bonnie and Clyde as a live simulcast across history, A&E, and Lifetime. And ironically, it did the exact same number on all three networks. Huh. And we thought for sure, like, oh, Lifetime's going to get screwed in this scenario. <laughs> and it didn't. They all delivered, you know, a couple million in their discrete demo, which said something interesting to us. And now we're you know, rolling up our sleeves and saying, okay, you know, these networks do talk to very discrete audiences. 
Are there partnerships outside of our company that we should be looking at in terms of creating content together, partnering with other people together to offer different things to different audiences? Maybe storylines change, maybe endings change, maybe, you know, let's have a little fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, you've had huge success at a &E Networks with event programming. You had Hatfields and McCoys, uh, which we've referred to, which went on and won. You know, it was an Emmy nominated, Emmy awarded uh, miniseries. Um, Mark Burnett's The Bible obviously was a spectacular success, but you've also said to me, um, uh -oh. you can't have, <laughs> you can't, uh, it's no I, longer. I love that it's uh -oh. called Mark Burnett's The Bible. Know, yes. Like, he didn't write it. It was my fucking it. Bible. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Write it. He produced it. <laughs> he right. produced it. You know. <laughs> I knew that. Um, the uh, but you said to me, you, if, it's no longer event television. If you start to have an event every two weeks, was, or yes. Month. Look, I mean, you know, the, the mini series is back, and uh, that makes me, you know, we had no idea what we were doing, and we didn't go. We're going to bring the mini series back, you know, and that wasn't our plan. It was holy shit, we've got Kevin Costner, you know? <laughs> and, and that's what took off. And, you know, he read a script and he loved it. And it was commissioned as a four hour. And he called me from the field and said, I want to do six hours. And I didn't know how to say no to Kevin Costner. So I said, okay. And, you know, we were sort of off to the races. And um, it ended up being a perfect Hollywood ending. Um, and, and it was a great project for us. But I, you know, just from a being able to support these entities, you know, we started seeing what was coming from the field. And I was able to make judgment calls about, you know, pull all the marketing from other shows. It's all going into this. You know, this is going to be the thing. And we could see it and we could adjust. You can't do that for 12 projects a year. You, you know, you, these aren't just the costs of producing a show or creating a show. It's how are you going to pivot your entire organization to support something in a meaningful way to make it an event, you know. And and that that's a that's a unique moment where, where you can do that. We have Roots coming, and believe me you, the entire company is going to be focused on Roots. Right. Um, and I think that's an event television. I mean, you know, if you're 40 or younger, 45 or younger, you don't really remember Roots on TV. Right. You just know it was a big deal. Right. And, and that's a privilege for us to be able to retell that in a in a modern way, and, and I think that will be a big event, but there'll be an enormous amount of marketing that goes behind that and other ancillary costs that aren't just sunk in the production. Mm -hmm. um, so Les, you have the most successful series on television on air, uh, but you also see NBC having The Sound of Music, Fox announcing that they're doing the live version mm -hmm. of Grease. Um, where do you sit in all of this? You know, we, we've looked at those special events very well, and obviously live television events do really well, and we have a number of them. We've looked at those. The right one hasn't come along. We are doing a big miniseries. As Nancy said, the miniseries is back. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're doing The Dove Keeper with Mark Burnett producing. Um, <laughs> Good luck. Mark Burnett, The Dove Keeper. A big, the you moment. know, right. It, 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 it's, it's a big sh Jewish story about Masada, you know. So, um, you know, and something that Mark's very familiar with. You know, but, but it will be a big event. So, so we, we're, we're looking at the world somewhat differently in our programming. And, and, you know, that's what's great about this world. There are so many different ways to sell your product that you can try different things and come out successfully. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for Jeff, and, and but for everyone on this panel, Disney just bought YouTube Network Maker Studios for $500 million. Do you wish you had? <laughs> well, I'm, I run Universal, so I have no idea about right. that. No, um, I, you know, I do think, you know, I think that that says, though, everything that we've been talking about up here, which is that these distribution platforms and the international opportunities create such, um, such opportunity for content at all ends of the spectrum, whether it's big, huge, you know, $500 million intellectual you know, video games or events or smaller movies or even you know, smaller TV series like, like Maker Makes for YouTube channels, right? So I think it just shows how this is the age of content in the sense that these distribution platforms are enabling all things to be successful. Who knows whether that will be a good acquisition or not, but it does show that content is becoming more and more important. As no, no Ma I mean, Maker Studio is a very good company. I, don't, I have no idea about the price or whatever, but we're all doing that. We're all doing that in a much smaller way, obviously, and Disney made a big bet on it. 
But our interactive group is doing a lot of original series that don't cost very much, and there's original content for the web. And, and as Jeff said, these things are becoming economically viable. So you want to get content on in as many places as you can. You know, we have CBS, we have Showtime, we have the CW, we have syndication, we have our online content. Producing all these different ways, we sell them differently, we distribute them differently, but they're all very lucrative. And once again, going back to the first question, it's why the future looks so bright for all of us. Yep. So CBS stock is at an all-time, almost at an all-time high as you know, this, in the past few months. Mm -hmm. um, how do you keep that up? Keep growing, keep you know, telling Wall Street that what we're doing and how we're doing it and keep succeeding and uh, we intend to do that. We like the stock price where it is. We, we think we've just begun. We think there's a lot more to, to go. I can't talk too much. We have earnings next week, so I don't want to get mm -hmm. in trouble, but we're very confident. I have a phenomenal management team, both creatively and financially, that I love. I think our game plan is the right game plan. I think we have a growth, growth profile and uh, the future looks very bright. Um, upfronts are coming up, and you yeah. haven't made your pricing predictions yet. No, I haven't, and that's because <laughs> my sales guys have, have sat on me, and they don't want me to do it. But uh, look, the, the, this is the time of year where there's the normal dance between the advertisers and the networks, mm -hmm. be they cable or, or, or broadcast, where the advertisers say, oh my God, the sky is falling, things are terrible, trying to bring pricing down. And the networks say, hey, wait a minute, we're doing great stuff, and the Super Bowl was the highest rated show in history, and network television's great, and cable's great. So it's the normal dance. We are very excited, it's a very exciting time of year. We're looking at all our pilots this week, which is always a lot of fun, because mm -hmm. there's some that you say, what the hell happened? This was great. <laughs> yeah. And then out of nowhere, out of left field, there's this little pilot with an unknown writer and an unknown, ac unknown actor, and you say, oh my God, I got Everybody Loves Raymond. You know, right. that, that happens. So it's a lot of fun. We look forward to the upfronts. Uh, we look forward to putting our schedule together. And we are optimistic we're going to do very well this year. Okay. Um, Nancy Cable is all about scale if you want to have leverage, so, so people say. Um, what does the acquisition market look like from where you sit right now? Um, well, that's an interesting question for me. We're a private company, so I, we get to do things very privately. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, um, look, the bigger the distributors get, it, it's going to raise the question again for the content providers, and mm -hmm. um, is scale necessary? And, you know, there's obviously there's efficiencies, but at the end of the day, um, you know, no matter how big you get, these entities have to operate on their own. They have to be disc dis discrete brands. They have to have their own original programming. Um, you know, so they're, you know, I think it's an interesting time. There's also a lot of money available, but not a lot to buy. Right. And so, you know, that, that's a challenge. We're, we're all looking, but, you know, I think Maker was just as much about amassing talent as it was anything else. Um, and that, you know, we all see the need for that. So, you know, look, if the right opportunity were to come up, I'm, I'm sure our partners would endorse reviewing that with me, but, you know, right now we're still turning over rocks. Right. Um, uh, Jeff, it, it's, it's believed in town that within a few months, Netflix will be in the um, feature film business that you, we will have, that we will see uh, what they did with House of Cards happening with television where they'll get top directors, producers to produce content to be distributed on Netflix. Do you believe that's true? And how would that impact you? Well, I, I don't know if it's true or not. I, it would make sense given where they're going with their business. I think it's great. I mean, I think, I think we make movies and they can buy our movies. So, you know, I think that the more people out there that can distribute the content we're making, um, you know, is great. And I actually think Netflix, what they've done with their interface, the ability to kind of, you know, target what somebody wants and how they want it, it's been great for the back end of all of our products, both on the film side and the, and the TV side. And so I have no idea whether it's true. We make, you know, the, the reality is, you know, we make a lot of uh, lower budget movies too. And we often, you know, are looking for places to put them when they're not worthy of a wide release and the marketing associated with that. And I think whether it's Netflix or somebody else, I think the, the, the different models of releasing films is going to be an interesting, an interesting kind of development in, in the movie business. So I certainly hope they do it. Um, they've certainly, I'm a huge House of Cards fan. And it has implications internationally, too. I was in China a couple months ago. I was shocked that House of Cards is the most popular 
show in China, right? Wow. So um, a lot of CBS shows are, are up there too. Big, but, ba uh, big Bang's yeah, pretty high. Big Bang's pretty high as well. <laughs> but these things just have implications it's across right. the globe. Um, so I think it's great. I think if it's true, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, so Les, um, people are, you've talked about the, uh, how people are very pessimistic in the media about when they talk about ratings, the future of broadcast. So um, you have, you know, none of our children are watching television or CBS in the way we do or did. Um, how Hopefully that's because they're playing video games. Yes, right. <laughs> Right. No, my, my children are watching CBS. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, what keeps you the, up at night? The, the world has changed very much. You know, you can't. You know, I still look at overnights, but it's not nearly as important as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Eighteen to forty-nine is not the be-all and the end-all because the world has changed so drastically. You're right. You go on a college campus, you do not see a television set. Yeah. But when you look at how many people are watching our shows. Scheduling becomes a bit less important, but the numbers are hanging in there and the amount we're getting paid for it is hanging in there and doing better than that. So once again, our job, everybody on this platform, if we keep doing the content we're all doing, life's going to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Life will be beautiful. People will watch it. They will pay for it, except for Ariel. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the ecosystem is going to be terrific. You know, you talk about Netflix. I think Netflix has been a phenomenal thing for our business. People say, oh, they're producing House of Cards, which I agree with you. It's fabulous. They're competing with HBO and Showtime. Who cares? Who cares? There's plenty of room for good content. There's plenty of room for competition. In the meantime, they are paying us for, to carry our content, and we love that. Mm -hmm. So... I would also say there's a tendency to project technological change faster than it actually happens. Right, so yeah. You have to kind of balance both out. I mean, we have two great comedies coming out, Neighbors and Million Ways to Die, next month, and we're reviewing the media plans earlier this week, and we buy CBS, we buy NBC, right. we buy ABC. You know, it's still a lot of people in this country are watching broadcast television, and the best way to kind of get a movie launched is to buy Network Prime. I think, Nancy, you so. gave me a stat, 98.7%. 98.7% of our viewing is linear. I mean, staggering. Staggering. Linear television. And right. it, it all comes back to us by day seven. And, right. so, and then of the 1.3 that's left, 24% of that is video on demand. Um, and I think you, when we spoke earlier, you also said, people don't buy a marketing message through banner ads. That no. <laughs> no, I mean, that premium video is a really great proposition, and advertisers want to be in it and around it. And... Um, and, I, and I think it's, and, and we can do so much more with our advertising clients um, in our brand space than we can on our websites in a banner ad. I mean, that's just not an engaged experience. Um, doesn't mean that there isn't a market for that, right. but you know, we still are a great proposition. Right. It's um, interesting, you think about, I'll take Call of Duty as an example, we have over 40 million players. We have a direct relationship with all of those players. We can stream videos, trailers, promotional materials, we have a direct connection with them every day, and yet we buy tens of millions of dollars of television to enhance the experience and enhance the brand. And we're not going to do it at the same rates we did last year, but, um, uh, and that's what, when we go to the upfronts and have our negotiation, but I think that there is an enormous place when you're building the value of intellectual property, you have to use all the tools that are available to you and those tools are some of the most effective tools that we have. You know, we're not only content providers, and, but you know, we are huge marketing machines, mm -hmm. and that's, we probably don't get as much credit for right. being that as we are. Right. So we're almost out of time. Quickly, uh, one quick question for everyone on the panel. Um, no one here has a ton of free time, but what, what do you do, what do you watch or do for your own entertainment? Oh, I'm so excited with Good Wife this year. <laughs> I mean, hats off, man. That Thank completely, you. I, thank you. I mean, that's hard for a writer's room to do. It's hard to completely re-energize a show, and I, that, that's, hats off. Okay. I'm playing now you say Skylanders with yeah. my, my, the new Skylanders with my 11-year-old, and the, helping to create the characters for the Skylanders is something I get very that's excited great. about. Okay. Sports. Okay. That's what I watch to relax. Uh -huh. And what I'm, on, I'm on ESPN more than I'm on CBS. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I, I hate to admit it, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, okay, and what are your honest. teams right now? Who are your teams? What are my teams? Yeah. You know, very happy with the Clippers last night. 
Okay. <laughs> Very happy. Had so happy he's going to buy them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not spending $500,000 on a video game. Um, yeah. 500 million. Right? 500 yeah. million. <laughs> yeah. 500 million. Right. Yeah. Same as the Clippers. I, I actually, sports too. I just moved from London and I had to watch the Dodgers and, you know, and the Lakers in the middle of the night. And now I get to watch them at 5 p.m. So it's fantastic. So sports is what I watch when I'm not reading a script or watching a movie. Well, I don't get Time Warner, so I don't watch the Dodgers, you know, so. Uh, right. Oh, Got to subscribe. Out. Sorry. <laughs> out. Sorry. Out. 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 We'll see if we can change that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, um, uh, Jeff, Les, Nancy, Bobby. Thank you, Janice. Thank you.